thank you for having thank you for having me. Do you think it, it will work? Yeah, so we're, we're going to be working. We're going to be. So uh, thanks for having me. I'm very excited, uh, Marshall. Uh, that was incredible. And then Propo, I think I will be speaking about scale and how we can, in a way, uh, uh, make a difference in a variety of scales, right? Uh, and I am a designer, and as designers, uh, we, in a sense, work within context, a complex context that uh, provides much challenge, but also a lot of opportunity. And those, again, can be at a very micro level, where someone can make a difference with a single object, single, um, uh, in a sense, intervention, but also at a systems level, at a macro level, where you might, who knows, uh, be a contributor or participant in um, a societal change. Um, and then, uh, this is not about uh, the practical. My presentation is, uh, in a sense, uh, about wicked problems. Uh, and that is a term defined um, by Horst Rittel and Melvin West, both uh, design uh, theorists, uh, uh, the latter an urban designer. And I'll explain that in a second. Um, I wanted to um, begin by saying that the talk will also dovetail into a recent conference that we organized uh, at the college. And the conference, uh, New Context, New Practices, looked very much at this issue of scale and how designers and design educators can prepare a new generation of designers to be, uh, in a sense, relevant in this new changing landscape of design and also of culture. Um, so um, uh, let me read you uh, three core goals we had when organizing the conference that I will try to sort of, uh, illustrate through my talk. The very first one is the increasing complexity in the nature of scale of scale. But if you saw that example, that very poignant example of a helping hand, that was at a very micro level, meaning one-to-one -one individuals uh, perhaps making a difference that ripples through an entire family, who knows, even a community. Uh, expanding accountability for predicting the outcomes of design action, and a lot of, I think, what really matters now is for designers, but also for all of us citizens, is whatever you do, that it really does matter, and that uh, you are, in a sense, responsible for the outcomes uh, of what that action uh, will, in a sense, um, enact. And then lastly, uh, de-escalating demand for interdisciplinary collab collaboration, meaning that we have to work together. A lot of these wicked problems are complex in a way that uh, a single individual, a single, single discipline will not be able to solve uh, these uh, wicked problems. So uh, scales. Uh, this actually comes from, uh, obviously, retail uh, t-shirts, but it also was used uh, quite effectively by Rem Kuhas now, when putting together a tome, an architectural tome, on uh, Ramco House's practice, Bruce Mouse as well, where they defined early in the uh, in the decade, the or 1995 actually, the idea that uh, design and uh, itself is a sequence of scales. Uh, so I think this diagram does a great job at that, uh, particularly when it comes to design, uh, in in sort of establishing. Uh, uh, relevance and impact. And I think we have historically at times defined design in the innermost uh, circle, but uh, the reality is that design always has, and more so, uh, has operated at all these different levels. And I'm going to try to show you examples that actually uh, sort of work their way through that sequence and, and those scales in order to, in a sense, reassure you that uh, we are on our way to hopefully a, a better uh, tomorrow. So, so <laughs> talk about scales and talk about wicked problems, right? So I'll define what a wicked problem is. Well, I won't. Horst and my friend Melvin will. So uh, a wicked problem is, in their words, it, uh, a problem that has no definitive formulation, meaning that defining the problem itself is the problem or is a problem, uh, and then it might help uh, sort of um, detail this further. The solution depends on how the problem is framed, 
uh, stakeholders have radically different worldviews and different frames for understanding the problem. The constraints that the problem is subject to and the resources needed to solve that problem change over time. And the problem is never solved definitively. So uh, this is uh, G8, right? Obama was actually there. That was his first sort of, uh, G8 summit. And you can imagine the, uh, or the scale of problems, right? And then, well, as you know, popular imagination when thinking through these events or popular, uh, in a sense, uh, perception is that these events do not solve any problem. Uh, the reality is not that, in a sense, there are many other uh, meetings along the way that tackle problems at a variety of scales. And then at this scale, of course, you have leaders debating issues, and that's probably much as they can do, and they hopefully do a good job at it. So I think this guy did actually a better job uh, when looking at scales, because one of the things that he realized is that he could actually attach facts to a global world image in a way back to Marshall uh, so that we could at least as a general community, global community, understand large scale wicked problems in a way that at least we would perhaps begin to frame the discussion. So remember wicked problems, one of the big, big problems of a wicked problem is that it is difficult to define. The definition of the problem is actually part of the solution, if at all. So uh, PowerPoint. And so uh, another sort of trend in design, but also culturally, is this idea of collecting best practices, right? So there's no one solution, but it's important to understand who is doing what and why and what is working and what, what is not working. So there's been recently several exhibitions in design, design world, that have tried to collect some of some best practices. And you see scales from a massive chain all the way to, let's say, a hippo roller that allows uh, anyone in this world that needs to walk a, a kilometer, five kilometers, to get their water instead of opening a faucet in your bathroom in the comfort of your home wearing a pajama, your pajamas, that that person can actually get that water without breaking their backs, right? So. Uh, so uh, I wanted to show you actually some of the topics discussed in that massive change exhibition, which are very telling. And they're reassuring for me as a designer and my students. If you look at those last two, design is very much at the center of the discussion and a necessary ingredient, right? But it's also obviously found in a variety of other topics. And also, uh, this is the most recent exhibition that I visited very recently in New York, yes. Uh, called uh, um, the des Why Design Now? And it's like the Cooper Hewitt if you're there to visit. So uh, we're going to focus on talking about uh, these, and I'll give you a few examples of what is out there, these very topics. So uh, this is the Ford U, right? Ford T, 100 or so years ago, 1908. Ford U. Ford, of all companies, with their not so shining record when it comes to sustainability has created a concept car that sort of was launched as a concept in 2003 where uh, it is recyclable, meaning it is beginning to hint at a cradle-to-cradle -cradle, uh, sort of reuse of materials. There's a lot of soy-based plastics in here. There's a lot of sort of a, a smart manufacturing so that the assembly line, speaking of Ford, right, and the idea of the Ford T, remember, that the assembly line was built in a way to optimize for this is a new definition of a, of a production line where the parts can actually be in fashion. Uh, energy, I don't know if you know this bike, uh, so uh, we are bike enthusiasts. This is an electric bike. It goes 150 miles an hour. This is the R. Uh, and mission one. Uh, so it is possible uh, to actually design a lot of the things that we actually take for granted nowadays that are actually not well designed and design them well or better. Uh, this is my favorite. I own one. I, o o I own one and it's a wonderful bike. And the logic of it is quite inverted. It's an A frame as opposed to a B frame, right? So the power of, let's say, uh, a redefinition of, of been true 
assumption. Uh, and this is a folding bike. I take it and I fold it and I have it in my office. And it has revolutionized the idea of the folding bike has revolutionized co commuting. So in a way, my last two examples, you could in a way at least minimize them and say, we might not need a motorcycle, we might not need a car all the time. We might actually or could use a bicycle. And then speaking of bicycles, I don't know if you know Believe in Paris, but it's a great example of, let's say, a troubled example because, well, remember, a wicked problem never is perfect. Uh, it has never a perfect solution. Uh, but it's a public system, uh, paid but public and shared. So it is about community, which is a big topic. I think in some of the great uh, newest possible solutions, temporary solutions, of a better future, meaning that we share things. For example, a, a great concept idea, yes, that uh, most of us will buy a power drill and use it only once, where in reality, if we went to, let's say, Home Depot and rented one when we needed one, there would be so uh, less production of useless tools that sit on our garages as uh, uh, curatorial specimens in an exhibition of uh, failed or to be projects. Uh, clarity. Uh, I, I often oops, back. I often show this example to my to remind them that design can actually be a diff, the difference between life and death. Uh, we are not superficial practitioners. So uh, imagine yourself in a highway and not being able to sort of drive properly or uh, safely. So this is sort of the new typeface. Uh, and a signage wayfinding system for US American highways. Uh, and I don't know if you know this project, but this is Deborah Adler and, and this has uh, revolutionized the idea of prescription and, uh, and a distribution system so that it allows for clarity. Uh, a lot of deaths in seniors particularly uh, when uh, self-medicating comes from uh, misreading labels and misusing medication. And this system tries to do that uh, very well. And it comes inspired of a, from a, per, a personal story of hers with her grandmother. Yep. Next. I'm getting to the good stuff. And then, of course, Apple. Uh, uh, Apple is not about technology anymore. It's about communications. I mean, Apple is actually the new AT&T, in a way. AT&T is there for a while, but probably will be replaced by a, an interesting new hybrid of communication, of branding, and of uh, eth ethereal services. If you think about Apple as a hardware company, which it was at the very beginning, now Apple is actually a software, or not even a software company, it is a services company. And that's a huge revolution in the sense that I. Apple is now music, Apple is now communication, Apple is now something else. And then last, uh, one of my favorite projects still, uh, and this is the one laptop per child, and it's very dear to me because actually I'm from Brazil and from Uruguay as well. I, I have sort of a mixed background, family in both places. And then uh, uh, both Brazil and Uruguay have adopted uh, the one laptop per child as an initiative within public education with great success. And the, the heart of this project is that it's actually an economic model, it's an offset economic model. So uh, what happens is that a, a, a thriving, let's say, first world economy, in this sense, you, I, here, with purchasing power, can actually, for a modicum of a price point, can actually buy a machine for you, for me, for us, for our child, and then another duplicate will go to someone else. So it's actually amazing Lee, I think apropos in terms of Marshall's discussion that there is small gestures, right? Generosity, right? That can change the life of a, an entire culture perhaps, at least when it comes to education and access um, and in a sense prosperity. And then this is actually a new version of it that uh, actually sort of thought through is still a prototype, but uh, before the iPad. And I mean, just by looking at these images, if you were a kid and you were reading uh, you know, 20 years into the future, that very same book that you know very well, where the wild things are. I mean, look at the transformative power of that, right? And it's a very cheap technology. This technology will cost $75. It's even cheaper than the first one, which uh, uh, 
in a way was um, to the hundred. There's some off uh, on costs, but uh, we're getting to a future perhaps where a lot of these things will be really readily accessible. Yes. All right, we're gonna really uh, fly through this. And then how do designers work and how do um, uh, designers put some of these things together and try to solve wicked problems? Um, they do by understanding people and how people sort of work and how people live. Uh, this is smart design, realized in the 80s that actually uh, grips uh, for a variety of extreme user groups, elderly and children were or needed to, in a sense, be uh, addressed as opposed to stay on universal design, and then uh, created tools for specific age groups with great success. So research, uh, IDO is a great example of methods and we'll trailblaze through these. Uh, collaborative teams, they do a great job at this. In this room, you probably find a few designers, but you will find also social scientists, engineers, computer scientists, and politicians, you know. Uh, this is a great example of that in a sense that uh, it showcased through an ABC Nightline show the power of design when bringing people together to brainstorm and work through the big problem of, uh, let's say, uh, mobility within a supermarket and shopping. And then uh, a few methods that are employed by designers, uh, site uh, uh, surveys, ideation, scenario, planning, and prototyping, in this case, a very curious form of prototyping, uh, paper prototyping for interface design. And then uh, methods, speaking of methods. I want to show you one method that is very dear to me, quick and dirty prototyping. The name says it all. Do you know what this is? This is a, a group of surgeons coming together in a room meeting, and then over the course of a few hours, uh, deciding that uh, uh, low invasive, non invasive surger, sur surgical tool needed to actually have this particular configuration. So, what is the makeup uh, of this new professional and, and these new competencies that we need in order to solve wicked problems? Uh, great methods and best practices to hopefully make a difference. So, this is Google. And one of the things about the redesign of the headquarters that was uh, praised and talked about in the press a lot when this happened a few years back is that the spaces were collaborative. So this is a contemporary company doing very well, understanding that people need to work together across boundaries, across cubicles. With two slides that are actually a sequence that are, I think are actually very revealing. This is a 2001 um, study by the Design Council on what we should be doing. And it's a little bit overwhelming when you read it, when I show it to my students. Uh, suddenly, I think there's a sense, oh, can we do all of that? Are we all of this? I mean, do I believe that I can do all of this? Uh, I think next, uh, back, back, sorry. Yeah, and then, <laughs> uh, these are some of the attributes or at least uh, competencies or outcomes uh, when using design and when working through design. And if you l remember that previous slide, these are a bit of a match. And we believe that I think design can make a difference. We believe that engineering can make a difference. We believe that social scientists can make a difference. We believe that humanities can make a difference. We, we can make a difference, but we have to work together. Wicked problems are tough. They are perhaps not uh, they don't have easy answers. They're more about process, and we could, in a sense, make a difference if we work together towards it. So uh, uh, the conference itself is now online, so I encourage you to visit us, and there's a lot of good materials in there. Thank you very much.